And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelt. Welcome to PrennerCast. Yes, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Don Gocher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if you want to. Visit us online at printermedia.tv. Hi. Dom here. Welcome to this week's edition of PreneurCast. And this week, Pete has managed to get an interview with Oren Claff, author of Pitch Anything. Now, that's a book that we talk about quite a lot on PreneurCast and we recommend. In the interview, Pete and Oren talk about pitching versus selling and how pitching is relevant to any business, big or small. And also look out at the end of the interview for a little bit of an announcement of the next time Pete and Oren are going to have a chat and how you can join in. Oren, buddy, how are you? Well, uh, I am doing well. Good to talk to you again. This is happening um, frequently enough to make me happy. I like (laughs) these conversations. Absolutely, mate. So off the back of, I guess, what we've termed internally the... uh, the leaked conversation that we sort of put up on the blog the other week after our uh, one of our convos. Um, it's good to actually have you back on an official capacity on the Preneurcast podcast. Uh, yes, and um, like Foghorn Leghorn in the cartoon, you know, we'd log in, chase each other around for eight hours, and then log out <laughs> and uh, go have a beer. So That's that it. seems to be working. So I guess what I'd love to sort of talk about in a, a bit more of a structured way, as structured as you and I can get anyway, um, is sort of about you know the book Pitch Anything, which I absolutely love and you know I've been preaching for quite a while now. But more importantly, how that I guess kind of relates back to you know the small business owner, the online entrepreneur, and I guess sort of you know the difference between selling and pitching, and kind of start with that, and I'm sure we'll go into some some great content. So from your experience talking about Pitch Anything and, and dealing with people, what's what is the core difference between you know, selling in the traditional sense and handling objections and all that sort of stuff compared to sort of pitching a deal and not necessarily pitching a deal um, to get $500 million worth of venture capital, but even just pitching a deal to, to get something happening? Yeah, yeah. This is really interesting. So if we pause on this for a minute, I hear all the time these, use wor- these words used completely interchange- interchangeably, right? I'm going to pitch. I'm going to sell, I'm going to sell, I'm going to pitch, I'm going to present, I'm going to sell myself, I'm going to go pitch a deal. But if we look at that for a few minutes, those are two totally different things. Mm. And I know in many ways, because uh, Pitch Anything, my book, is on many days the number three book in sales and selling on Amazon. Yep. Which is interesting because I know nothing about sales and selling. <laughs> right? So so I know there's a difference. What I know is a pitch. So I'll tell you the distinction in the way I see it. Awesome. And and we're all salespeople and many throughout our careers and in a given day, sometimes we have to sell and sometimes we have to pitch. But let's not blend these two concepts. When you sell – It's very relationship driven. You usually have multiple approaches on the target, on the prospect, on the buyer. You build a relationship over time. Let's just use the example of paper, right? Do you guys need paper again this month? No, we're pretty good, right? Um, Why don't you, we're happy with our supplier. Why don't you come back next month and let us know if you have any interesting new products? That invitation to return lets you know you're in a sales process. Mm. Uh, You can build a relationship. When you send an email uh, after getting a no, it isn't rejected. They may further consider you. You're in a sales process. You've got a conversion funnel of your own going on. You've got a process, and um, you know by and large, the prospect is willing to listen to you uh, over time, multiple approaches, consider your various products and lines, and if you're persistent and consistent, eh, a lot of the time you get a, you get a deal done. You, you, sell. Can, you can wear them down. You can keep handling the objections over and over again, and just over a, a course of time, you're going to end up being the last man standing in a lot of occasions. The last man standing, 
right? And this is why you hear, hey, I wouldn't take no for an answer. Mm. And I got the deal. <laughs> I wouldn't take no, but that's, that's a phrase that only belongs on the selling side where you build a relationship, trust over time, show your wares, whether it's paper or rocket engines or whatever it is, you know, build relevance. Uh, and usually those people will be buying that st stuff, not on a one-time basis, but either a commodity or ongoing purchasing. And it's the sales process, all right? Pitching something totally different. Absolutely. So let's, let's, let's break that down. So I've read the book and we've had many conversations about this. For, for the listeners, what, what is the difference? So think about it like you're going to get a loan from a bank for a commercial mortgage to buy a building. This is a good example. You walk in and you say, hey, I'd like to buy this building with the credit I have, and we're going to put a Kinko's coffee shop in there. Next to it, we're going to put a coffee shop, and next to that, we're going to put a retail store and, um, that sells whatever, paper. <laughs> and so this is our concept. Um, this is our business plan. These are financials. Here's our credit. Here's our mortgage application. The credit committee then looks at that. You give the pitch, what your plan is what your background is, what the economic upside is. They're going to want to know what the debt service coverage is, not to get too technical, but how are you going to pay the payments even if your plan doesn't work out, mm -hmm. right? Where's the money going to come from? And so you make this, you make the case, and then they go and evaluate the case, your pitch, and they come back and they say, no, we don't like the numbers. We don't like you. We don't like the plan. We don't like your credit, and we don't think this area needs another Kinko's, okay? Your pitch is over. If you come back to them tomorrow, next week, the end of the month, or six months from now, and say, hey, I want to talk to you a little bit more about, um, you know, my proposal to buy, uh, to get this mortgage, right, on this commercial building, they're, by and large, going to say, what part of no confused you? Because... <laughs> You understand those two letters. They go N-O. It even sounds like N-O. No. Go away. You pitched. We said no. Unless there's some fundamental change in your credit, right, or the market or something we didn't yep. know about the first time, um, we don't want to do this deal. So a pitch is one bite at the apple. It's one pull at the trigger. It's one chance, right? Uh, and so the, so sales is a relationship and, and now we're getting into it. So in a pitch, I don't think it's relationship driven at all. How much relationship can you build in a one hour meeting? Mm. Okay. How much rapport can you think you can build enough of a relationship? So people go, Hey Pete, um, we really don't like this deal, but we have such a good relationship with you after an hour. We're going to do it anyway. Right. Yeah, exactly. That this doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Okay. So uh, keep in mind that a pitch is about not about um, leveraging a relationship as much as it is doing a great job to establish your credibility, your status, and the upside economics of your deal. And it's very, very focused on doing those things. And so lastly, it's unforgiving to mistakes. So in, in motorcycle racing, right, you have, um, you know, a couple kinds of bikes, right? So you have bikes that are highly, highly tweaked and they're, you know, you're out on the racetrack and they're fast, right? And they're very competent and capable. And some of them, if they're forgiving of mistakes, if they're forgiving of mistakes, they're going to be um, slower yep. and the winners. Right in these unforgiving uh, environments, you have a chance to either win or lose. So the pitch happens in high stakes, high consequences, certain outcomes, unforgiving environments where really a decision is going to be made, and maybe not even in over an hour, but maybe that decision is made in the first ten or twenty minutes mm. of you being. And I think too, even for a lot of small business owners, I know you know there's 
a, a cleaning company that I've sort of done some consulting with. And, you know, from their perspective, they treat going in there and tendering for a job more like a pitch. And they've got that right sort of mindset in that, you know, they're going in there, they're going to get this job, they've got to go and sort of, you know, sell their services and, and their cleaning services. It's not a long-term purchasing sort of relationship because someone's signing a 12 or 18-month contract. So it very much is a pitch. Uh, and I'm sure there's plenty of other people out there in similar industries with similar sort of dynamics of, of making sales, for want of a better term, and they treat that process as a selling process even though they don't have that opportunity to go through the traditional sort of objection handling kind of scenario. They go in there, they pitch their tender, they walk away. And this is so important because builders are the same. Anywhere, I, I guess, where there's a long-term contract being signed, it, it very much is more likely a pitch type approach you need to take as opposed to going in there with a sales mindset because it just doesn't seem to it's the it's a circle in the square hole it doesn't quite fit yeah i and pete and just hearing you talk a metaphor formed in my mind that i haven't used before but i think it's very powerful all right a pitch in the way we do it is a performance Mm. i'm not at the metaphor yet right but when you see us pitch we don't just wander up there and go, we know a bunch of stuff about our deal and we're going to tell you a bunch of stuff. We know what we're going to do minute by minute for an hour. We have a clock, right? If you've ever been on a radio show, they run it on a clock. Yep. They know exactly when they're going to do the news, the weather, break to commercial, when you're going to talk about what. There's a clock. We run our pitch on a clock. Now imagine going to a play. Here's the metaphor that I think works. Imagine going to a play and the actors have all just kind of agreed on a general theme <laughs> right? and they run out on stage and say shit to each other, right? Yep. And, um, you know, and it just kind of unfolds. Well, I mean, they have that. It's called improv and it's funny, right? Yep. But sometimes it's not funny and sometimes it's not good and sometimes it is good, but by and large, it's r- fairly random. And it's funny, but it's not serious, and it's not good. No, exactly. So we think about the pitch that you know, we would no more present a play, you know, Masterpiece Theater, with a bunch of us just running on stage and generally within a thematic saying dramatic things, then you know, we wouldn't do that and expect you to pay for a, you know, $200 for a ticket, all right? And – in the same token, we wouldn't go to a pitch and just say, all right, well, let us tell you about what we have. It is a performance, and we know what we're going to do the first five minutes, what we're going to do the second five minutes, what we're going to do with the 20-minute block after that. And at the 30-minute mark, we know specifically what we have to do. In some ways, and this is, this is a metaphor that um, I have used before, it is like landing an airplane, a large airplane. You don't just fucking go land it, right? There's waypoints you have to hit, Yep. right? And so if the pilot in a complex landing like San Diego where there's buildings, it's just a very complex approach. There's waypoints you have to hit. And if you miss a waypoint, then you go got to pull off and try mm-hmm. again because you know the rest of the landing is not going to go well if you miss a waypoint. So I think pitches are produced. You know where you are along the way. You have waypoints to get through, and you. this requires a bunch of effort to put on a performance like this. But the reason you make this effort is, as you said, it's one chance or one of very few chances to make this presentation to this customer and win the contract. So, you, so it's worth investing time and energy and money to figure out what you're going to do in those moments that you have in front of the buyer. And I think that um, um, sales, right, preparing for sales, I think, is a lot about preparing for objections. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it's just a lot about being honest and integral and knowing your product and shifting on your feet and thinking fast and responding to the customer's needs. 
Right. And so, something that kind of popped into my mind to, I guess, build on the analogy you just used there, and, and we'll touch on it shortly. So the main thing I want to jump into in a moment is sort of the structure of a pitch, because I really think you've nailed that from a performance perspective of what is the curtain call and what is the first act and the second act, and we'll we'll, we'll just wring this analogy dry. But the, the whole play kind of scenario is that the reason people enjoy plays is that it's emotive, it's engaging. And I think, you know, to sort of, you know, try and build this bridge in a very, very poor uh, way I'm going to do here is that, you know, the croc brain stuff that you talk about, uh, and we'll touch on this really quickly in that, you know, the croc brain is something that I'll get you to explain. But where I see that is that, you know, most selling traditionally is very feature-based, advantage-based, and obviously even benefit-based. People sort of are probably familiar with the the FAB approach to, to selling features. You know, you talk about your feature, then you talk about its benefits and the advantages and stuff like that. And it's it's very rational. It's very dry in a lot of ways. Whereas I think with a, a pitch that you talk about, because of the crock brain, which I'll get to, to explain, you need to have more emotion and a more engagement. And that's what makes plays interesting as well. Yeah. Have, so, I, have, I, have I just ruined that analogy? Or have I made any sense at all? Yeah. <laughs> You've, you've made sense in that you've introduced uh, seven <laughs> subjects simultaneously, which are all very important. Um, all right, so, so let's try and put a fine point in the um, selling versus pitch and then move into, you know, the biology of these situations. Yeah, cool. Okay, um, which I think is where you're going. Uh, so so v- I think you should view, unless that buyer, investor, customer, bank, whatever it is that you're going to meet, will let you call them up frequently, come in, you know, as needed, then you may consider yourself to be in a pitch situation where you want to think about less about how am I going to overcome objections, think on my feet and scale what I'm selling to what they need and more about I sell something, they need it. What is the best way to provide a commanding, controlling performance about the thing I have and make it as desirable and myself uh, as feel as competent as possible within the 20 odd minutes I have to really impress them? All right. So if you have a limited um, access to the customer, you really want to think about how do I build this great pitch and less about how do I go in there and s- build a relationship and sell this, okay? Uh, so, so then I think we move into what a pitch does, as you were saying, Pete, is it creates wanting. Yeah. Selling, by contrast, creates credibility for yourself and really accurately conveys the features and the benefits of the product. All right, but the great pitch creates wanting a moment of wanting. All right, and um, in order to create this wanting, there's a very specific pathway. The information you have needs to take through the biology of the human mind. Right, so the human mind doesn't take information in through the eyes or the ears, or the senses, and there's, there's many different ways to accumulate information, but all of that goes in through the primitive part of the human brain, okay? And, we, and by the way, make sure to give everyone the link to the video we have on this, where we yeah, go through we'll, we'll put all, with we'll put visuals. A, we'll put a few links into the, uh, the show okay. notes at uh, preneurmedia.tv, where all the show notes and transcriptions are, and they'll all be there, so people can head over there and um, shit the show notes out to, to get some other material, for sure. So this is the way I explain it. When you walk up to your buyer, to your prospect, or you get them on the phone, and you begin talking... They do not hear the concepts and the ideas and the detail and the emotion and the things you are saying in in detail. What they initially have to decide is very primitive, and it boils down to this. This person that is in front of me, should I – what do I do? 
right, to survive this situation? Do I try and <laughs> it dangerous? Do I try and eat it because I'm hungry? Or do I try and mate with it because I'm horny? The three human emotions, angry, hungry, and horny, are the first filter through every human mind. Mm -hmm. And your uh, ideas and your product and yourself have to initially get through that filter. Angry, hungry, horny. As to get through that filter safely and be accepted that you're not dangerous, that you're not something to be mated with, or you're not something to eat. <laughs> and that's harder than you think. Okay? It's harder than you think. If you don't organize your information to pass that initial screen, everything you say is massively filtered and detuned. And this is really why pitches tend to go bad, right? Is we scare the biology of the other mind listening to us. We scare it, right? Or we put it into some primal instinct and it doesn't listen to um, the, you know, as you said, the cleaning services, right? The features and benefits, it doesn't get to that part of the mind. Hmm. And so some very specific things that we go through that you have to do in order to get past the primal filters of the initial, uh, as you said, the crocodile brain. We have some great visuals on this, which make it very simple to understand. But um, the successful pitches do this, right? There's, there's six or seven thing check boxes you have to hit. I mean, so clearly, the, if it's uh, a pitch on cleaning services, right, I'll just give you a quick overview. Well, the initial discussion of it better be visual, better be some clean visuals. It has to be concrete what you're offering, or at least clear that um, you can describe these services in a concrete way. It better be novel, right? So, so novelty, like why can't you tickle yourself? Like try to tickle yourself, right? Because <laughs> you, it's, you know, you don't look, cause you know what's happening. Like your mind knows what your hand is doing and it can anticipate that action, right? You can't tickle yourself. Yep. So, um, the mind looks for novelty and that's what, what, uh, generates attention. So if it's not concrete, your pitch isn't novel, it's not visual and it's not fast, then you're going to offend or scare the crocodile brain and you don't get to pitch the part of the mind that will actually listen to you. So, so again, uh, we may be making all the mistakes I just described because we don't have – in while well, you and I are talking visuals, but if people jump over to the link, we have visuals that will um, explain this very, very mm -hmm. clearly. Absolutely. So, so once you sort of, you know, got that awareness, and obviously, yeah, as I said, make sure you head over to preneurmedia.tv, and there'll be links through to, to the pitch anything um, videos and and PDFs and stuff that you're talking about there, Oren. But one thing I'd love to talk about is the the structure of a pitch really quickly. I know we've sort of got a bit of time left for the podcast, but you know, the, your sort of, I guess, philosophy or the the tried and trust tied and tested methods of, of of pitching have kind of come down to about a, a twenty minute sort of schedule for want of a better term is that about right yeah so i mean here here's the issue so lots of people because i represent uh some groups that invest come and pitch us i might see you know a couple pitches a week sometimes a couple a day and the issue is they ramble on <laughs> for an hour or more in this kind of hey let's all get on stage and just pick a role and randomly perform to some thematic ramble on yeah all right the issue is that the span of human attention is not an hour. Human beings cannot pay attention to something, especially when they're not passionate and excited and interested about it for an hour. Right? The, uh, any group of scientists will say the maximum span of human attention for classrooms, for business meetings, for perhaps a podcast like this is about 20 minutes. So in terms of structure, you've got to boil the meat of your pitch into a 20-minute uh, section where you provide the big idea, 
the problem, the solution, the features, the benefits, the upside economics, the track record, yourself as being credible, and the story of this product or service that you sell has got to be packaged in 20 minutes. Now, at the end of 20 minutes doesn't mean you, you just walk out the door. There's other things to do, right? But introducing the service, explaining the, how it works, the fundamental economics, how it's delivered, what the deal is, who you are, and why someone should work with you has all got to be packaged tightly within 20 minutes or less. So when you start to talk about structure, I think those are the things, you know, that, that you're um, – uh, Pete, that you're talking about. Yeah. So, so what are the two biggest things out of all of that? Because we could obviously spend hours ourselves just talking through that pitch process and the the actual arc that you need to make during that 20 minutes. What are the two key things that you think are the most important that you need to sort of hit on in that 20 minute pitch? So, what what I see done poorly most often is capturing two things: the big idea. What's you know. What's interesting and novel and the benefit um, of what we're selling, right? So um, it, I don't know cleaning services that well, but since we talked about it, let's just try and come up you know, here on the spot with a big idea for cleaning services, right? So if you're in the market for cleaning services for your buildings – one of the issues is who you are giving the keys to your building to after hours. Yep. Security. If any problem comes to a company, it tends to be from giving the keys away to people they don't know. At Acme Cleaning, we, anybody can clean as well as we can, right? Because you put the fucking squeegee in the water. It's not that hard. Run it down the window, okay? And then you look at it and you go, is the window clean? And then you wipe a little spot that you missed and the window is clean. And then you move on to the floor. Anybody can do this. A blind man who just landed from Mars. <laughs> can take five minutes of training and clean your building as well as some guy who's been doing it for 20 years. The fundamental importance at Acme Cleaning is the 45 hours of security training and bonding that we put every employee through. So if you care about security, then you'll be interested in the rest of this presentation. Would you say a uh, part of it, because obviously that is one example that's came off the top of your head there, and obviously you made that not about cleaning. You made the big idea about something bigger um, that differentiates you from most likely your competition because they're talking about the type of lotion or formula they use in their bucket with their squeegee. Do you think that's important to a certain degree as well, actually making sure that what your big idea is is actually different and is obviously that's what unique and is what's novel is that is that a fair statement yeah that is so i think in this case and tying it back to the biology i think you're going to scare the human mind of the person you're pitching if you try to convince them very early on in the pitch that you're better at cleaning than the next guy Mm. okay why because that is a low contrast very low. It's hard to believe that one guy is better at doing a window than the next guy. Yeah. Now, it may be true that you have the patent on a cleaning formula that takes half the time, and that is a huge value proposition, but you don't have access to the part of the human mind that will hear that level of detail yet. You can do that later. All right? So where the we're better than the next guy at cleaning fails is it is not high contrast. The crocodile brain can't look at that and go, this is different and novel from other things. I need to pay attention to it. 
Mm. Right. I, I, I completely agree with that. And this is something, you know, in the tel- telecommunications company that I own here in Australia, the, where we sell and install physical phone systems, you know, the piece of plastic that we install and, and bolt onto a client's wall and the, the physical pieces of plastic we put on their desks are exactly the same plastic as the next guy. There is no differentiation because we buy the, the leading manufacturers of Via and Alcatel and those sort of manufacturers. So the, the, the actual hardware, the raw you know, physical thing the client gets is exactly the same as the next person. So we have to differentiate ourselves away from the product because the product is so much of a commodity, it's not funny. It's even more of yeah. a commodity than cleaning. Now, now, later in the pitch, once you have access, and this we're probably going too deep here, to the neocortex, the smart part of the brain, now you can go into the minor differentiation. Mm. The minor differentiation between um, you, know, you and another service. And maybe those things count. But initially, you've got to latch on to these big ideas. That's why I said it's not about cleaning better. It's about you know, security. And that may or may not be the issue, but that's why I went after it because it's differentiated. It's big, high contrast, novel, visual, right? And you can, um, you can get access to the, to the attention of the other people, of, you know, the mind that you're pitching when you, um, you know, when you, when you create this kind of novelty. Mm. Something I heard you talk about before, which I think is kind of, you know, ties in with like not talking about the cleaning. And it's something that I really wanted to make sure we sort of spoke about today, sort of, you know, in in the podcast is that a comment you made on uh, Chase Jarvis's show, who's uh, had a number of great guests on who, you know, we've had on the show before, Ryan Holiday and obviously yourself now and a few other people, you know, if you, if you haven't seen Chase's show, chasejarvis.com forward slash live, uh, great show where he interviews some fantastic people on, on camera and, and you were a recent guest of his. And one of the cool things you said, which you know I talk about a lot and a good friend of ours, um, Ed Dale, talks about a lot and, and Ed and I have our book coming out called It's Not About the Product and it kind of talks to a statement that you made on that show, which I think resonated really, really well and I'm sure you know exactly what I'm about to say. And the, the statement was, Believing in your work is not an effing tactic. Um, and I think that was a really cool statement because I think, you know, I want to talk about it, but I think it does kind of relate to what you were just saying there that it's not about the cleaning necessarily, it's about everything else. And do you want to sort of explain that and give that a bit more context? Because I, I really want to make sure we, we cover that because that's something that I, I truly believe in and was so glad that and really love when other people say it too because it just supports the, the argument that I continually try to make. So I think a lot of people that I see coming in pitching um, are confused about the value equation in the room. By that I mean they come in and they want our money. You know, they want us to issue that whether we're buying a copier or investing in their business, they want us to give them money. Mm -hmm. So they prance and dance around and do all kinds of supplicating behaviors to try and win our money, right? So by and large, if I say, um, hey, you know, we're really interested in the copier. Why don't you do a feasibility report for us? And they go, if we do a feasibility report, would you be interested in buying the copier? And I'll say, yeah. And they'll run off and do that stuff. Fetch, you know, they'll, they'll go fetch me a feasibility <laughs> report. They will say, uh, if I say, hey, why don't you give me a discount and be more interested, they'll give me a discount. If I say, why don't you give me two months free, they'll say, hey, if you buy it, we'll give you two months free. If I say, stand on your head, light your feet on fire, and run around the room on your hands, and then do 15 push-ups, they'll do that too. All right? These are all supplicating behaviors to try and win accounts. And so what I try and formulate is a way that we can understand that the account, the guy who's going to give us the the contract, the person you're selling to, is they only have money, right? That's all they have. But we are the prize. They have to understand that we are honest, ethical, credible. We have a great product that we're busy. And the only thing they are is a customer. And that's the commodity. Mm. Right? You, can, you can always get another cu- the customer. You can always get someone else to give you the cash. You've only got so much time in your business, in your team, in yourself to actually deliver that solution. So you're the, you're the prize. You're the unique part of this. 
we are the unique part of this. So I try – when I'm selling or pitching or both or either, I try and reframe everything they say as them wanting me. Okay? So they say – you know, if they say, hey, Oren, can you get us a feasibility report, right, then I will reframe that and I will say, no, I will not let – give you a feasibility report, right, because – this is very simple decision. You guys know your business better than anyone else. Okay? If you really need a feasibility report, maybe this isn't right for you. You don't understand this product well enough. Are you sure you understand your need for a copier well enough to be taking up my time? See, that's a reframe. Mm. Right? And it frames me as the prize. It frames me as the important party in the room. So I reframe everything they say as, um, uh, you know, as them needing it and me as having it, okay, and not needing their business. So what came about the comment you said is so we saw on Twitter people said, hey, right, um, these, do these tactics work overseas or do these tactics work with – you know, such and such kind of <laughs> yep. these tactics, believing that you're the prize, that you are the most important part of the um, transaction, the product you have. Let's go back to cleaning services. You have the best cleaning service. You have the best formulation. You have in a lot. You have a patent on your formulation. You bond and and train your employees, right? And your trucks are clean and you make them wear uniforms and you have managers to make sure everything is done right. That is valuable. All they have is a cleaning account. What you have is something extremely hard to build and, and, and provide this service, right? And so if they don't behave well, then you're not going to even work with them because who wants a bad customer? So you're the prize. They have to try and win your attention and your service, okay? And so believing that you are the prize and that you are the most valuable part of the transaction is not a tactic, all right? That is something you better have. And if you don't have it, you know, let's, get, let's work together with me and Pete and the videos and anything we have to get there. When you walk in a room, you better believe what I have is more valuable than these guys' money. And if they don't behave well and they don't look like a good customer – and if they don't uh, pay respect to me, then I'm going to leave and take what I have and take it somewhere else. <laughs> People understand the value that I bring. It's really funny you say that because literally the, this morning before before we got on this call, I was I was going through some emails and uh, an email from um, uh, a, a person I work with quite quite a lot, um, Jay. Uh, was talking about a client that was absolutely doing their head in. They were demanding, they were sending, you know, three emails a day, demanding stuff that was outside the scope of works and they did the right thing up front and this is something I teach a lot of people is when they, you know, get a deal and do a successful pitch is that then set the context and expectations of how the relationship is going to play out. And that's what this person does at the start of every new client. They sort of set the expectation of this is how we work, this is the process, this is what you're going to get delivered, this is how it's going to get delivered very, very well. And this particular client is just breaking all those rules, ridiculous expectations, not playing playing the game by the rules set out. And Jay was basically saying, what do I do here? Do I wait till the contract's over and then cut them? Do I cut them now? What do I do? And, and my advice was literally a two-line email. You are the prize. You have the process. Get rid of them. Um, I use a bit more profanity in my email, but basically it was exactly the same thing. I couldn't agree with you more. Is it like, you know, you're the prize. You have the, the, the business. You have the outcome. You have the solution. They came to you. They want you. They need you. And I, I think, you know, the only time where you really need to, to be in love with your product, and this is the thing I took away from your statement, believing in your work is not a tactic because so many people, and you're talking about it in the context of photographers on Chase's show and you know, in the context of cleaning or an internet marketer who has an e-book or somebody trying to find a joint venture partner to do a promotional with. Basically, so many people sort of, they go into the conversation and they just talk about how brilliant the product is. And they get distracted by everything else. And I think, you know, realistically, you know, to build a successful business, be it pitch something or even just build the business, it's not about the product. You have to 
have a fantastic product. You have to believe in the product, but the belief is not the end goal or not the tactic. The belief gives you the, the core strength and the, the belief and the internal understanding or, or, or foundation that then allows you to, to actually frame the meeting, frame the deal, frame the relationship as you, you are the prize and not the supplicant. And I think that was a really cool thing I took away from the book, but also from your conversation with Chase is that, you know, that you have to believe in your product. There's no question about that. You have to believe in it, but that's not the tactic. That is just a foundation that gets you the tactics of prizing versus supplicating. Well, I think, I think, yeah. And to summarize that, if you know that you're the prize, the customer has to win you, then you're willing to walk away. And unless you're willing to walk away, you act needy. Mm. And neediness kills deals. Okay? So if neediness is the number one thing that, that will kill off a sale or a contract or a customer, then how do you get rid of it? Right? You get rid of it by being willing to walk away. I'm going to interrupt you there for a second, mate, because this is something that I think a lot of people have trouble with. And I know a mutual friend of ours, Neil Strauss, writes about this uh, in the game. And I know Pitch Anything's been referred to as the game for business, which I think is really, really cool. But how does someone get that that belief and that feeling? Because, you know, a lot of people go into a meeting and they sort of need this meeting because they need to pay the bills next week. And they, they do go in really supplicating and... Um, and wanting, I know, like all the negotiation books and all the pickup books, and you know, it's the, the person who who has the least or feels like they have the least to lose actually wins. So, how do you get that mindset right? That you know, here's how I work on that mindset. Right, I roll into one concept: the service that I provide. The track record that I've developed, that I've delivered for clients that I've done it before, the strength of my character, the internal confidence in my ability, the knowledge that my competitors are not as good as me, and the fact that working with me is a lot of fun. And I mash all of that into one. Uh, ball of understanding that I am the best. Do other people's product uh, that you know cost more and clean better? Yeah, maybe. You know, just to keep using the cleaning cleaning metaphor. Do other people do it faster? Maybe, but in combination, my ethics, my character, my experience, the depth of my commitment my passion, the quality of my product versus the price and the fun of working with me is the best that the client is ever going to get. All right? And so knowing that, I'm, they have to come halfway or more than halfway. I'm not just going to sit there and pitch them. They have to look at me and say, Oren, we like you, we love this product, and we want to work with you. And if, that can, if they cannot say that, and I'm not going to continue selling or pitching, or I'm not going to oversell myself, if they can't find their way to the value that I have, then I'm going to leave. I'm going to take it away. There's specific ways to do that. If you watch the videos, we give some examples, all right? But in answer to your question, you have got to compress and mash up all these things about yourself and know it so that if somebody starts to question anything about your product, yourself, your integrity, your track record, your ability, your cost, right, yep. that to some small degree you'll work them through it, right? But if they're not going to come over and say, we appreciate you. We understand what you have. We want to talk about some details, you know, um, to, to get the contract. But if they're not going to really acknowledge you for everything you have, then you start to take it away and say, I'm going to go somewhere where customers understand this value, right? And so, um, again, we give specifics, but that is the um, 
the nature of how you have to approach, how you have to approach uh, prizing for yourself. You have to truly, truly know that amongst all the options, you're the best. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's where believing in your product is important, but it's not that tactic that you spoke about. Now, mate, before, before we finish up, because I know we, we, we've both got lots of stuff to get, get on with in our schedules, I've got two really quick questions for you. Firstly, this is the question I often ask people on the podcast is, what question haven't I asked that I should have? Oh, yeah. Okay. So the question that you should have asked, but you didn't, is can you give me a great pitch right now? <laughs> Do you know, actually, let's, let's do this. Let's, you, you can give something away today, but let's actually like, organize another call where people can actually come on, maybe like a webinar or something. You've you got time for that at some stage in the next couple of weeks, and we can actually do a pitch on there. We can dissect it. We can do a, a real deep dig on something like that. I think that's smart because people hear me talk about this subject, but I think the next natural question is, let's see you do it. You're so great. Okay. So uh, yeah, let's let's, let's, let's do another up. webinar and let's give a live pitch on that one, and you can see um, how I think it should be done in um, in perfect form. Perfect. So, so let's go. Uh, we'll put some links in the show notes at preneurmedia.tv to that. Um, I'll make sure my team puts up uh, like a, a page that will have either the opt in to the webinar or a replay of the webinar for people who sort of watch the show and in the back catalogue because obviously the shows are, are available and you know, not just this, this episode but all our other episodes are available um, you know, in an evergreen format. So let's say um, preneur.co forward slash pitch anything. Um, hopefully that domain's available. I'm sure well, that page is available. So go there. You'll have a, an opt-in for a webinar that will have the dates on. We'll work out that sort of stuff and you can... Um, Sign up for the webinar, and obviously, if you're on the email list, we'll, we'll let everyone know about that via email in the next couple of weeks. So that's a that that's the question I should have asked, and we'll perfectly we'll segue that into another sort of hour or so together in a couple of weeks' time, which is really cool. The other question I've got for you, just a, a personal interest thing, is how did you pitch Chase? Obviously, you got you got on Chase's show. Now, was it an introduction? Was it a pitch? But even if it was an introduction, there still has to be a pitch somewhere on the line. Even I'm sure if you know I said to to you, Aaron, I've got this great deal, whether it's you know, referring someone else to you or vice versa. This has to be a pitch at some point. No one does a deal purely off an introduction. So, so what was the process? This is sort of, I guess, answering that last question. How, yeah, show me how you pitched Chase. What was the process? So I think by and large, they contacted us and we said we're not available, which communicated to them we're not needy. Okay, did we want to do it the next day? Of course. <laughs> but we know if we say, hey, guys, let's do it tomorrow, that they're going to say, oh, these guys aren't ballers, right? They need us. And so we said, you know, hey, we just don't know how to calendar this. Let's, you know, talk about it and calendar it a few months out. And I think that's, um, that's what brought them to the table. Yeah, so it was surprising, not supplicating. Uh, and I guess for, for want of a better term, manufacturing status, which is something I, I love talking to you about and we'll, we'll try and weave that into the actual uh, webinar or live call or whatever we're going to do. So make sure people check out the, the show notes and preneur.co forward slash pitch anything. I'll make sure Florence uh, puts a page up there where people can get all the details about when we're going to get together again or the, at least be able to see the recordings of, of when we get together again. Okay. Yeah. Great. Awesome, man. Right, well, uh, thank you so much for your time. I know you, you've got a, as busy a schedule as I do, so thank you so much for making the time to come on and, and share everything about Pitch Anything. Uh, the book's available on Amazon, uh, obviously all over the web, and uh, we'll get together again soon for not only our usual chats, but more importantly to add some more value to the community through this, uh, this webinar. Great. All right, buddy. Uh, um, always good. I got to bounce, and I will talk to you soon. Sounds good. See you, mate. Okay. Been enjoying another fine episode of PrinterCast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at printermedia.tv or drop them a line via PrinterCast at printergroup.com. <laughs>